Welcome to today's 3M Health Information Systems webinar. My name is Jared and I will be your host. In today's webinar, we'll explore risk adjustment with HCCs and 3M CRGs. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can do this by using the questions feature in the web meeting controls, which is located in the lower right portion of your screen. We are recording today's presentation and a webinar archive will be available. So look out for an email within the next week that includes a link to the archive. A PDF that contains all of the presentation slides is available for you to download, and that's located in the handout section of your web meeting controls. We'll also provide a certificate of attendance to webinar attendees, and that will be emailed to you upon the completion of this webinar. Today's presenters are Colleen Deegan, Michael Molohi Fogu, and Megan Clark. Colleen is a consultant for 3M Health Information Systems, providing advisory services for outpatient CDI, clinical coding, and revenue cycle management. Michael is a CDI and coding and classification consultant for 3M Health Information Systems with extensive expertise in healthcare informatics and analytics. Megan is also a consultant for 3M Health Information Systems, providing advisory services for payers and providers that are implementing 3M methodologies for population health and quality initiatives. Colleen, I know we're all excited to get started, so I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Jared. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to start today's session with a polling question, just to get a sense of uh, you know everybody's baseline. So the question is, how familiar were you with hierarchical condition categories or HCCs prior to today's webinar? So you have four choices. I'm going to read through those choices if you would start uh, taking the polling question. So is this this is my first introduction to HCCs? I have a very basic understanding about HCCs. I have studied HCCs and have a moderate understanding. And the last one, I would consider myself an expert in HCCs. So Jared's going to go ahead and start uh, compiling the, the polling results, and we'll be reading those to you shortly. Um, so HCCs, you know, for me, I, I, I hate to say I'm an expert. I, I know a lot about HCCs, but I think sometimes in the expert mode, we have to remember to still stay humble and learn. So we've definitely seen quite a bit of use of HCCs, a lot of conversation um, in both the payer arena and the provider arena around these condition categories. Very interesting, um, you know, part of a big part of the conversation we're going to have with all of you today. I do see some people are still joining. Okay, so I'm going to share the results here. So we had 10% uh, said this is my first introduction to HCCs. 56% said I have a very basic understanding about HCCs. 31% said I have studied HCCs and have a moderate understanding. And 3% said I would consider myself an expert in HCCs. Thanks, Jared. So I hope I didn't influence anybody's response there, but I think it's really good to see over half the audience has, has some understanding about HCCs and, and almost a third of them with some moderate understanding. So we hope to expand on that knowledge today and also introduce the 3M clinical risk groups to you as well. So we're going to start today, um, today's session really taking a look at um, kind of risk adjustment as the trend away from fee-for-service. So really take a look at for a lot of you, this will be familiar information, but just kind of setting the table for today's discussion around what, what we've experienced in the last almost 35 years. So if we look at um, the very, kind of what I looked at at the beginning was the DRG system. So I, I've been in the field of coding and documentation and health information for over 25 years. Um, I'm sure many of you listening today have more experience or more years of experience or different types of experience, or maybe even a little less you know, years of service. So definitely a lot of knowledge, uh, collective knowledge out there. But so I think what I can definitely say, and I'm sure most of you would probably agree with me, is one thing we can say is we've seen a lot of change and just demonstrated in, in this, this, this uh, particular view right now. So starting back in 1983, before my time, I'm going to admit, um, but DRGs uh, were first, that methodology was introduced in 1983 by CMS, and it was really the very first prospective payment system 
uh, the, there was a goal, um, major goal was to control rising costs of care. So that was really, uh, you know, CMS's main intent and it is a prospective payment system. With the success of that, of the DRG system in 2000, CMS introduced the ambulatory payment classification, so known as APCs. So with the APCs, again, what we saw was a large growth, a shift to outpatient for services. So CMS and other payers started seeing an increase in, in trying to control costs for outpatient services. So again, that growth increase and the success of a prospective inpatient system led to the implementation of ambulatory patient classifications. And again, those have been around since 2000. In 2007, we saw a refinement of the DRG system, the Diagnosis Related Group system was refined by CMS to be MS DRGs, also known as Medicare Severity Diagnosis Related Groups. And this was to better differentiate severity and acuity and to uh, better uh, you know, state cost of care. And with MS DRGs, that was the first, we really saw quality of care come into play. So what we see on that third bullet there around pay for performance. So present on admission indicators, I remember as a coder starting to you know, assign present on admission and, and how that changed my role as a coder. Patient safety indicators or PSIs and hospital acquired conditions or HACs. This was really the attempt here, you know, the goal to uh, pay for quality of care and not volume of care. We also are familiar with, um, I'm sure many of you, the 3M APR DRG system that is all patient refined diagnosis related group. So it's a whole, you know, it looks at all of the patients, not just the ones that would be a typical Medicare beneficiary. Within the APR DRG is the SOI, the severity of illness and the risk of mortality or ROM. So both of those really, APR DRGs are used for reimbursement in some states, they're used uh, universally across the U.S. for quality measures. So those SOI and ROMs are really big drivers. So many hospital groupers on the inpatient side group to both an MSDRG and an APRDRG. And definitely anyone from the CDI or inpatient coding space knows we definitely look at those SOI and ROMs to um, severity of illness and risk of mortality to help Again, just, just describe that intensity of service and that risk of mortality based on, similarly to DRGs, the main reason the patient was in and the comorbidity. Um, we also have, uh, you know, again, that final kind of comment here on risk-based payments. I'm not going to talk a lot about HCCs and CRGs here because Megan and Michael will be definitely doing that. But I did want to touch on bundled payments. So the bundled payments, um, something we've heard about for a, a, maybe five or six years, I'm, I'm going to just think about that off the top of my head. I don't have a firm date on that. But this is where hospital, the hospital, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist voluntarily agree to accept a single payment for an episode. Uh, so that, and that's a predetermined sort of fee. Um, and what we saw that most, like one example, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with is orthopedics. So we first saw it come out in lower extremity joint replacements which any, many of you know have now been moved off the inpatient only list. So it's kind of, you know, again, you see the journey. There are actually 48 of these episode bundles. Another example on the medical side would be a congestive heart failure bundle or an acute MI bundle. So definitely uh, they're voluntarily, they're voluntary to, to uh, participate in, but they're definitely, again, goal, similar goal um, of controlling costs. So the basis of the conversation uh, for the for for today is around the clinical risk groups and the and the hierarchical condition categories. Um, so I think you know just before I leave this slide, just thinking in context of CMS's goal here, the trend away from fee for service into these risk based payment models is is threefold, and they talk about this a lot. Um, it is to number one improve care, number two reduce costs. And number three, improve the population uh, health of a particular group of, of, of a population area. I did put a vocabulary list on here and I put new in parentheses because again, some of these terms may be new to some of you and some of them may be, they're very familiar to you, but we wanted you to have them available to you as you, as you participated in this, in this talk today. Um, and the bottom three, I just wanted to highlight, because uh, that is really the basis 
uh, you know, of the risk base. So we have accountable care organizations. That's our traditional Medicare population, a group of doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers who voluntarily form a, par a partnership and share accountability for quality and cost of care. So we see the ACOs in our traditional Medicare population. The Medicare Advantage, also known as the MA plans or the Medicare Part C plan, these are private payers approved by Medicare to administer you know, to Medicare beneficiaries. It's usually organized as an HMO or a PPO. And then we also have shared savings where I see most shared savings. It's a similar payment strategy offering incentives to reduce spending. And that's typically what we see in a lot of our commercial payers going into at-risk contracts, you know, hospitals and payers. Similarly, in that commercial arena, just going into the same sort of shared savings or shared risk contract. So you see in the middle there are the HCCs, the hierarchical condition categories. And this is a risk-adjusted model designed to estimate future costs of care for patients. And then our clinical risk groups, it's really a measure of total burden of illness and resource utilization rather than on a single disease or a single service. So those contrast each other a little bit, but they also have some similarities. Again, Megan and Michael will talk in more detail on those shortly. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just a visual from both the payer perspective and the provider perspective. Um, so healthcare spending's share of the GDP or the gross domestic product was 18% in 2017. So 18% of the GDP spent on healthcare. That's, that's very, very significant. And it's expected to get up over 20% in the next decade. So it's already, here we are in 19, um, but again, forecasting out to 2027 to see an increase over 20%. So when you think about that growth and, and that need to kind of, again, control costs, make sure care is of high quality, health systems, providers, and payers, they need tools to understand cost and resource consumption. It helps them find the opportunities to reduce costs and to make sure they're still, while reducing costs, providing good quality care. So across the top, again, just this, the progression for our payers in from a prospective payment system, which was to normalize costs, that's our DRG and APC, we still use those heavily. Moving into the pay for performance, which is where the MS DRGs came in, CMS still uses APCs. They have created some composite ACCs, APCs in the, in the last few years. Um, but the length of stay, the patient safety indicators, uh, the penalties for not meeting readmission or targets, and then to the pop health for um, risk adjustment and data sharing. And then similarly on those bottom arrows there for the provider or the physician or the health uh, care organization, we went from production and efficiency to really in our, our world of volume or quality or paying for performance, benchmarking and targeting and you know really focusing on quality of care, trying to reduce unnecessary services, taking a look at you know, something as simple as an order set that gets, that's been in place for a long time for a particular service, you know, is everything necessary and the volume of tests or the number of times we do a test during a hospital stay, those types of things. And then again, the progression for the providers into this coordination of care, that's our ACOs and our risk sharing models and our MA plans. Um, so on this slide, just again, awareness of what we know today around revenue cycle. So at the top in the green, the traditional, what we call volume-based revenue cycle, and all of us in, in HIM and professional coding and CDI and, you know, the, the billing teams, we live in this world every single day, right? So the green, we register and verify our patients to make sure they have the right insurance. Uh, we see the documentation of the care. The care's provider, we're using that documentation to code it and classify scrub claims. We do claim submission. Um, we work a lot of denials, <laughs> uh, but follow up and collection. So that's a, a world most of us live in on a pretty regular day-to-day -day basis. We are shifting again to this population health or value-based revenue cycle. So while we still live in that volume base, that's still you know, very common um, payment structure for us today. We have seen not, not just up what's ahead, but what's already underway, you know, defining these populations and the attribution of these ACOs or MA plans, stratifying the risks and, and helping to identify where are those gaps in care. What we see the shift in care management and coordination, there, there's such a shift in the provider arena around a care team 
and engaging the patient, not so, we're, we're used to taking care of patients when they're not well, and we need to learn to manage a population of patients. So how, you know, the patients have some ownership in, in that as well. So how do we manage and engage patients? So you see provider networks, or you see a lot of care coordination, case management involved. So it's no longer just the physician, there's a whole care team involved um, in, this, in, in, in the care delivery in these, in these value-based cycles. So again, that, that kind of final shift will be to outcomes, which is quality and efficiency, total cost of care. So these provider report cards, where, you know, we do see those with our different payers. Um, certainly on some of the Medicare sites, you can, you can see provider report card information. So that's, that's sort of the future of, of our payment models. We're certainly not there yet, but a lot of that is already underway. Um, I did a comparison on case mix index to HCC risk adjustment. Again, just because I know so much of the audience will be familiar with that, that, that environment, that DRG environment. So remember the CMI or case mix index is the average relative DR weight, DRG weight for a, a hospital's inpatient discharges. So that CMI reflects severity and clinical complexity of care and resource needs, and that is an acute care reimbursement methodology or inpatient methodology. So we do see, um, you know, CMI, again, it's a prospective payment system for the hospital care. We'll contrast that to HCCs. This is really a determination of risk for an individual. So it's, it's again, that longitudinal care across the whole year um, translates into what's called an annual premium or what the payer may refer to as a per member per month prospective payment. We've identified the risk and, and that risk helps the payer and CMS determine, well, CMS determined to the payer how much they're going to need to care for that patient throughout the year. Uh, with the DRGs, you know, there's a relative weight assigned to each DRG that we, we may have a base rate that changes from geographic area, but the weight of the DRG is static for all facilities and it's an assigned weight for each HCC. So where we have one DRG, we have multiple HCCs aggregating into one RAF score uh, risk adjustment factor, which we'll talk again more about. Um, DRGs, again, calculate the CMI. HCCs calculate an individual's RAF or, or risk adjust factor score. Um, one DRG, similar to APCs, we may have multiple HCCs in an encounter. And remember for CMI and for inpatient, the principal diagnosis, any comorbid or major comorbidities and procedures if they're significant and surgical in nature drive that DRG assignment and that case mix index. So contrasting that to HCCs, which use diagnoses from inpatient visits, outpatient visits, physician office encounters. So all again, longitudinally, all the care that patient's receiving throughout the year. Um, we do calculate the CMI in real time, we think, right? When we submit the claim, we know what the DRG is going to be. It's, it's uh, calculated from the claim in the inpatient stay. Uh, HCCs contrastically aggregate all of that information into one risks or one HCC and, and RAF score. Um, and where the CCC, CCs and the MCCs can influence payment for that encounter, that inpatient stay, Diagnoses from any claim can influence the RAF score that's calculated at the end of the year. And that end of the year calculation, just like many of our prospective payment models, what we do today and document and report today affects that future payment next year. So that's very similar. So we, you know, again, following the coding guidelines, uh, we report all services are required to do that. But we always have to remember it does, even if it doesn't affect payment today, it might affect payment tomorrow. Um, so, you know, I'm going to end my portion of the presentation just talking about, you know, as you listen to the rest of this presentation, what's my job? What's my role as a coding or CDI or health information professional? As we all know, the basis of our work is on high quality documentation that's of high integrity. We work very hard um, as health information professionals to make sure that documentation is of high integrity. Just wanted to remind everybody what the purpose is because it's multifactorial. Um, the doctor would like it to just be, you know, a, a, con a continuity of care. So first and foremost, the documentation is for continuity of care and it helps providers understand treatment, you know, for their patients, other caregivers, so they can explain the care and the plan for their, for their patient. 
so that anyone taking care of the patient knows that story to help with continuity of care. It's certainly for proper payment of services provided. So we are entitled to proper payment for our services. It does help to identify trends, whether that's an influenza as an example I used, or a localized cancer in a particular location that may um, identify some, some trend that, that needs to be investigated. Uh, we certainly use this documentation, again, the basis of our conversation today to implement these new payment models. And we see how important, you know, good quality documentation is to carrying out research and innovative and new treatment options. Um, so as a HIM professional, I've always kind of said this as, as this, you know, more and more people are interested in good quality documentation. Our role has not changed. But what we have to remember is our role does continue to evolve. So, uh, you know, our job is to apply accurate, complete and consistent coding practices that lead to high integrity of, of health information. We should be facilitating, advocating and collaborating with professionals in pursuit of that, that we have good data that's reliable and trusted. Um, participate in query policies that support, again, high integrity of our documentation. And, and your individual responsibility to your field to advance your knowledge and practice through continuing education. So I hope that's why you're all here today uh, to continue to learn and evolve as a, as a coder or an HIM professional. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, so uh, we have a polling question. Um, and the polling question that we have is, uh, do you use hierarchical uh, condition categories or HCCs at work for any reason? The first question is, I do not use HCCs at work for any reason. The second answer is, I do see HCCs at work, but do not use them for any reason. The third question is, I use HCCs at work, but I am not sure what the reason is. Um, the fourth question is, I use HCCs at work every day to help with case management. And then the last question, I use HCCs at work every day to help providers and CDI. So we'll go ahead and give them a few more minutes, um, you know, the group here, a few more minutes to go ahead and answer that question. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, kind of uh, talking about what Colleen was discussing, um, you know, there's a lot of instances where um, we're using HCCs now sort of in the real world that didn't exist, um, you know, even five or 10 years ago. Um, case management is a really good um, area to, to kind of look at that. I mean, you know, most organizations have had case management for a while, um, but, you know, using those HCCs to sort of map out who to look at um, is one of those, those sort of interesting parts of how uh, we can use HCCs. Um, and uh, as soon as we get the results, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll have Jerry chime in and then we can kind of take a look at that. Okay, so for the results, we had 25% say, I do not use HCCs at work for any reason. 30% said, I do see HCCs at work, but do not use them for any reason. 5% said, I use HCCs at work, but I'm not sure what the reason is. 6% said, I use HCCs at work every day to help with case management. And 35% said, I use HCCs at work every day to help providers and CDI. That's pretty exciting. So it looks like, you know, we have kind of a mix, right? We had around 30-ish percent that said, you know, they, they, they work, but, you know, they, they see them. They don't use them for any reason. But then we had sort of that um, dichotomous uh, response where we said, uh, where the group said, yeah, I use them, use them every day for CDI, which is very interesting. Um, and, you know, as we're moving through this, I think it will be very helpful um, to kind of talk about, one, um, you know, what are the most, like, you know, common reasons that we're using this, um, you know, and, you know, what uh, is, is important about it. So, um, you know, value-based reimbursement really does change the game in terms of reimbursement in the healthcare field. Um, first of all, um, you know, methodol you know um, methodologies to capture a patient's uh, disease burden is a little bit complicated. Also, you know, trying to figure out where a patient is now, or a disease burden, where they're going to be in the future, uh, is, is complicated. But then, if you think about it, um, to sort of do those two things, and then also adjust payment for an entire population, um, as it applies to a one single provider, um, is even more complicated. But you know, as we're moving through, um, you know, sort of talking about how HCCs are built and what what things are applicable to HCCs, 
one thing that uh, is really important that we start out uh, to talk about is that um, HCCs really um, is a process uh, in itself, right? So HCCs is basically a three-step process where you know we're allowing for um, uh, we're allowing for organizations to code individual documents based on you know coding rules, looking at um, you know the information that's held inside of a document, and then you know associating specific codes to a specific um, you know disease or whatever the case is, um, and then you know aggregate that um, over a year. Um, and then after that year um, has been aggregated, kind of pulling up together all those scores um, based on you know, these individual conditions, um, and then applying what we call risk adjustment factor. Um, so that's the sort of risk adjustment sort of um, uh, technique that's used to say, okay, we have all these claims for this year, but then what is going to happen next year in terms of these payments? How do we give individual providers or or not how do we but in what way do we give these individual providers the amount of um, resources in terms of financial resources um, and uh, and payment to take care of these patients because uh, you can think um, you know just one single provider may have you know 30 or 40 patients on their panel um, and for all 30 or 40 patients they're at different levels well if you have 10 patients who have um, you know multiple um, chronic conditions um, that are being managed daily um, and you know these some of these patients are very reliant on their um, you know outpatient care services and, and providers that are involved in their daily care um, these providers really do um, deserve to, to, to sort of be paid in a way such that they can support their patients um, so that's kind of how the you know like I said reimbursement kind of changes the game you know the value-based reimbursement versus the previous fee for service where you had people sort of queued up and um, you know you had to get in line to get the service um, and you know providers were sort of given payment because uh, you know based on volume um, more or less or you know how many uh, how many patients they could see in a day was kind of a, a, a sort of a way that the outpatient world was sort of viewed um, so this is this is really a big sort of game changer now you know as you can imagine a lot of people are very confused about HCCs, and, and one of the things that I like to sort of start off with is a description. What are HCCs? You know, we've said what we've said what the sort of uh, description of, of you know hierarchical uh, conditions uh, are, and uh, one of the things that is very helpful is um, you know a lot of a lot of people say, well, you know, it's a model, it's something that we use. But it's really a statistical regression based model. And of course, you know, as most people know here in statistical modeling, regression analysis is, is basically a set of statistical processes for estimating relationships among variables. Um, and, uh, you know, in, uh, that statistical model, uh, modeling includes techniques for modeling and analyzing several variables um, to, to sort of focus on the relationship between what's, you know, referred to often as the input variable and sort of the uh, outcome variable, right? So that's kind of the basic model that they use, but they're using diagnosis codes, right? They're using those diagnosis codes to group them together and say, okay, here is a um, category of condition um, that we've seen um, cost a lot of money for a healthcare organization. Um, also to, you know, they, they count um, individual interactions um, between disease burdens. There's, there's a lot of sort of calculation there. Um, and that's kind of what, uh, you know, is used to apply sort of that cost grouping for predicting um, costs for an individual in the coming year. Um, now you can see here um, at sort of the last three bullets that um, there are two different types of HCCs. So CMS um, uh, has their own type of HCC and then HHS or the um, Department for Health and Human Services um, have their own HCC sort of uh, methodology as well. They're different, they're similar. Um, they're used in a different way. Uh, and, you know, the way that they're used at, uh, through HHS is basically looking at prospective cost. CMS is looking at the previous year and saying, okay, in the future, this is likely what their, um, you know, burden is and how, how much it's going to cost to care for them. HCC or HHS HCCs really look at, okay, what are, you know, um, all these aggregate of claims, say, in a quarter, um, and what is something that we're going to have to address at the next quarter in terms of paying these providers for the burden of, of, 
a, a, a disease burden that their patients have. Um, now, when we're talking about the HCC RAS calculation, remember this is the three-step process, right? So there's the coding um, of the claims, there's the aggregation piece, and only after that aggregation piece um, can they actually start to calculate uh, RAS score. Um, in the calculation, essentially what happens is, you know, we have the patient who's di diagnosed, who's, uh, you know, dur during the aggregation period, who's then either given, assigned, an HCC based on what a coder does and putting that in the claims. Um, and once that HCC um, ICD-10 code is tagged to that patient um, in the claims, then you know, all those claims are gathered together and then they're sort of um, aggregated and calculated. And they're looking at, uh, you know, in order to determine like, what do we pay this provider in this population for this time? Um, they're gonna add a couple of what we consider um, non, um, um, non-clinically related um, variables to calculate the risk adjustment factor, right? So um, here, like we can see, they look at demographic variables and then disease risk score variables. So for example, the demographics are, you know, is the patient an SNF? Um, is the patient, uh, you know, disabled? Are they, um, you know, at, in home care? I mean, uh, are they, do they require acute care frequently um, because they're, they're in um, acute care facility um, when this is, you know, or how many times they're in the acute care facility in that, that, that year. And then also they look at interactions between the diseases. So they're reflecting those underlying uh, costs for the next year. Um, and that, this is basically how they do it. This is the, the calculation that happens in the last step after the aggregation of the claims. So um, agency risk adjustment really is a tool that's used to make sure that, you know, take for example, two patients with the same gender and the same age, but one has a clean bill of health and the other one has multiple chronic illnesses. Um, both have their own healthcare providers. If healthcare payments are purely determined by age and gender, um, then two providers would receive the same amount of payment. Even though the treating and managing uh, the second patient is more complex and costly, in effect, the provider who treated the sicker patient would be underfunded and the provider who treated the healthy patient would be overpaid. When evaluating the economic performance of these two providers, really it's, uh, you know, the difference in the patient's illness burden um, uh, that's not accounted for properly. And so that's kind of what HCC is addressing in this, you know, sort of bigger perspective to say, hey, this is, you know, this, this, these patients need more care, so we're going to kind of bring attention to them. Um, so, you know, once again, um, back to our, the example we just kind of discussed is, you know, through, through the evolution of, you know, healthcare and healthcare payment in the past, say, 20 years, um, <clears throat> there's a number of ways that, um, you know, a lot of people at CMS, and HC, uh, at CMS and HHS and, you know, in clinical research have really tried to determine how do we get that, um, you know, provider and how do we get uh, sort of a population's um, disease burden under control? Well, we can start to use the risk adjustment techniques, whether they be HCC, CRGs, or EAPGs, <clears throat> to offer, um, you know, these increasing healthcare delivery costs, kind of to what Colleen spoke about, um, at, you know, high percentages of our, you know, gross domestic product, and also reduce those costs in a way such that the beneficiaries and the pro provider, uh, the, the beneficiaries, you know, have a lower cost um, to get the delivery of the healthcare, and then the providers have, um, you know, a, a lower overall cost to deliver that care. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, you know, is very important to understand is, is that, you know, what's your relevance, you know, like, what, what like, you know, in the poll, we kind of had a, that, that dichotomous outcome where we had the CDI people, you know, and, and, and like maybe revenue integrity that were like heavily involved in getting um, HCCs, you know, uh, you know, communication and coding and, and making sure that the documentation was there to meet the requirements. Um, but then we had, you know, a bunch of other people who said they've seen them, um, but they've never actually used them. And so, you know, I can say, you know, just from personal experience, I've worked with coders, um, you know, as a nurse and then as a, um, an organization manager and director, I've worked with coders to say, okay, well, um, you know, there are different devices in, say, your software or in um, different areas that you use for coding reference to indicate that this is an HCC, but why is it relevant to you? Well, once again, um, what you do every day is going to kind of determine what your provider, your organization is going to get paid for the next year. 
Um, and so, you know, some of the things like, you know, removing codes on a HICLA 1500 for just one ENM and say, you know, well, this ENM will get it paid. Well, yeah, it will, but does it reflect what's going on with the patient? Is it, um, you know, something that, you know, if you're looking in the impression and plan, are you looking at the very bottom of, you know, the, the note, if there's additional things that are in there, um, are those things being added to the claim? Um, are we, you know, are you resequencing these codes or are you, you know, looking at the um, resequencing just to sort of fit a narrative that you're most comfortable with? You know, these are the types of things that we like to kind of second, you know, just kind of check ourselves to make sure that we're doing what we need to do um, to meet everything that's appropriate for that patient. Um, now, he, I pulled a case uh, sample from a record review, and you know, I've, I've done uh, consulting for a lot of organizations, especially around health, um, um, HCCs, and this is a, you know, uh, one that we pulled uh, a couple years back that I thought was really interesting because this patient was seen in, um, you know, was basically seen, you know, had the same uh, primary care provider for five years, um, and so this, you know, was a patient who had a pretty good disease burden, I mean, a pretty high disease burden, meaning, you know, they had diabetes, uh, they were obese, CHF, and they had some sort of AF or atrial fibrillation. Well, in this instance, um, you know, when we're looking at their HCCs, we found, wait a minute, this patient was seen in the ED because of a syncopal event. Um, they were then taken, you know, they were seen at the ED, and, you know, as we know, ED um, providers don't often, you know, look at high specificity of diagnoses when they're um, caring for their patient. They're mostly trying to keep them alive. Um, and so this patient fainted, uh, it seemed like somewhere in the, in the, in the public. Um, but then the patient was then seen for an ED follow-up, which um, was interesting to me, where the doctor really did review everything um, in the note. But the only thing that was coded basically was, um, you know, the, the diabetes without complication, CHS, and the newly found AVNRT, you know, uh, based off of the ED record, and then I found, uh, you know, the ED found they were in acute renal failure, which I thought was interesting that, you know, however it was coded, that although acute renal failure was present, present CHF was present, diabetes without complications was also the diagnosis that was used. In this instance, we kind of looked at it and, and, and sort of analyzed it, and we said, well, if they just use the correct, uh, you know, diabetes with acute complications in the follow-up visit, this would have been captured. And then, of course, morbid obesity and hypertensive heart disease were things that weren't really caught and, you know, analyzed very well. And so, um, you know, they missed those interaction scores. Like we talked about those um, sort of disease burden interaction, uh, additional RAF scores that would have changed the score for this patient. I mean, we're talking, you know, a, almost a double in the score for the patient um, for the next year. And so that, to me, was a good find. And, you know, a lot of organizations that I go and look at their data, this is often some things that I find. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people who are involved in CDI can appreciate um, where they're looking in records and they're like, wow, you know, they're really caring for these patients, but we're not getting it. You know, it's, it's just, you know, missing translation. And so, you know, as we're kind of working through this, um, you know, there are some coding gaps. CMS is aware of, HHS, a lot of um, private payers are aware of. Aware of. Um, and, you know, we're talking about chronic care management, um, transitional care management, and HCC coding to give sort of an accurate depiction or description of what's going on with the patient. Um, you know, like I said, here's some of those gaps is, you know, once again, providers are coding their own documents, but it's really coders that are the expert in coding. The, uh, the providers are expert in giving the care and also, you know, documenting what they do. Um, and so, you know, in those outpatient facilities, if 90% of them are coding their own documents for ENM, uh, you know, there's the, uh, that's one of the sort of general gaps that exist. And of course, chronic care management and transitional care management is already happening. Um, a lot of uh, outpatient organizations really focus on, um, you know, making sure that they follow up their patient after a discharge from an acute care facility, or if a patient is really sick, that they're really, in, you know, um, updating medications, communicating to their team, and making sure these patients can get into visits uh, during off hours and doing all these additional things. Um, and then also, too, um, you know, a lot of these uh, organizations are unfamiliar with how um, the alternative payment models and, you know, MIPS are affected by not really plugging up these holes in, um, in uh, you know, sort of that gap that exists currently in HCC capture. Um, and so, you know, as we talk through this, I like to say, what can a coder do? So once again, um, CDI, Revenue Integrity, they can be involved. We can all be involved and really when it comes to value-based care, it's all hands on deck because it really affects us all, right? So 
you know, reduction in overall Medicare expenditure costs, um, you know, directly affects the taxpayers. Um, you know, overall reduction in costs of your, of your plan, even if it's a private plan, really affects everybody who's paying into their plan. Um, and so in this instance, um, you know, knowing which model for, for medical coder that you guys are using is, uh, is really important. Following those industry coding guidelines, um, you know, the CDI guidelines, clarifying with the organization, um, you know, like for example, with medical coders, you know, oftentimes they're, uh, you know, I've, I've heard where people say, well, I can only put four ICD codes to a claim. Well, you know, on a HICMA 1500, I believe you can put up to 12. And so, so that, you know, kind of reviewing those policies, uh, making sure that, you know, if there's resequencing happening, that there's a reason for it. And then also, you know, kind of closely working with providers um, who code their own claims to make sure that, that, you know, it's explained to them what they're doing when they're coding this claim and what the possible impact may be. And then of course, um, you know, as we all know, the problem list is a problem. So let's not start pulling stuff from there or let's not even, or providers are saying, okay, well, I'm looking at the problem list. Um, you know, let's remind them that we're looking at the document, not necessarily the problem list when we're coding these, this information. Um, and so, you know, kind of moving into um, what Megan will be talking about here, I, you know, I just covered HCCs that are used by CMS that has two different types. Um, but, um, you know, we'll be talking a little bit about a similar sort of methodology to risk group and look at uh, clinical categories that are, um, um, that are a little bit different. Um, and uh, uh, it's really, uh, for me, very exciting stuff. Um, but I'll go ahead and let Megan take it over. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Um, and before we jump into HCCs, we're going to go with another polling question. So how familiar were you with 3M clinical risk groups prior to today's webinar? So this is my first introduction to 3M CRGs. I have a ba very basic understanding about 3M CRGs. I have studied 3M CRGs and have a moderate understanding, or I would consider myself an expert in 3M CRGs. So we'll leave the poll open for a few more seconds, but again, just having an understanding of everyone's familiarity with 3M CRGs will help level set um, and just figure out where we'll start as far as an overview. So like Colleen, I, I don't wanna say I'm an expert, but I, um, I do have a lot of knowledge with CRGs. Um, so I'll be covering it at a high level today for you all um, and get started with that in a moment. So Jared, if you wanna close the poll. Okay, so results are in. We had 73% say this is my first introduction to 3M CRGs. We had 21% who said I have a very basic understanding about 3M CRGs. 5% said I have studied 3M CRGs and have a moderate understanding. And 1% said I would consider myself an expert in 3M CRGs. Okay, thanks, Jared. So that was kind of what I was thinking as far as the uh, the results. So um, you know, three quarters having you know either a basic understanding or a first introduction. So let's begin, um, like my with just defining the CRGs. So the 3M clinical risk groups or CRGs um, are a methodology similar to HCCs um, that are used for risk adjustment that is describing the health status and burden of illness of individuals in a population. So CRGs are a clinical and categorical model. This is uh, one of the biggest contrasts with HCCs, which is a regression-based approach. So regression models yield a statistical score, which Michael outlined, um, which can sometimes have more minimal clinical detail. Whereas categorical models, which 3M use, classify a patient into a single clinically meaningful category. So this means that CRG assignment reflects the individual's most salient health condition or conditions and provide mutually exclusive categorizations. So individuals in the same CRG category are both clinically similar and in their use of healthcare resources. And this enables um, the creation of a common language that clinicians and healthcare managers can use to understand, predict, and improve healthcare utilization. Um, importantly, CRGs do not rely on historical spending in assigning the CRG. Um, rather, it is 
looking at clinical information only. So this is a little bit different from um, what Michael described with the HCC RAF score that brings in some non-clinical information into the calculation. The uh, rules of the CRG logic are applied to capture unique relationships between and among diagnoses and procedures. There are extensive use of conditional rules which are clinical in the logic, um, and this prevents double counting of interacting conditions and false classification. Um, so in my opinion, I think the, the clinical um, conditionality rules are one of the differentiating factors with the 3M CRGs um, in that there is a much more um, um, clinical logic behind the scenes. So CRGs like HCCs are based on longitudinal data um, routinely captured on healthcare claims across all sites of service. Diagnoses are primarily used in assigning CRGs, um, but certain procedures and pharmaceutical information are, are used, um, but less often. Uh, the CRG logic accommodates both prospective and retrospective applications. Um, so you can use, use either, um, like HCCs has, one is prospective and one is retrospective, and CRGs, you could run it either way. Now let's walk through, um, just at a high level, the overview of the CRG assignment process. I wanted to focus a little bit more on uh, CRGs um, as a, at a high level, um, rather than getting into some of the details, just, just because I know this is um, most people's first introduction. So at the broadest level, um, you'll see that CRGs are assigned into nine health status groups, ranging from nine catastrophic at the top to one healthy at the bottom. Uh, you can see examples in the table of conditions which fall into each CRG health status and the total number of CRGs per group. Uh, the power of CRGs comes from identifying individuals with significant chronic condition in status five, and especially those with multiple chronic conditions captured in statuses six and seven. As you can see in the CRG methodology, there are separate CRG categories for those with a single chronic condition like diabetes and status five, and a separate CRG for the combination of two chronic diseases like CHF and diabetes and status six. So this is really showing the, the categorical nature of the CRGs. As we move down in health status, we'll see people who have a minor chronic problem like migraines or a significant acute problem such as pneumonia. Um, and CRGs are also capturing healthy individuals, which includes both acute illnesses like upper respiratory infections, um, as well as categories for newborns, pregnancy, and deliveries. CRGs are a five-digit code, and you can see on, at the example on the right, um, the CRG example is for 70602. The first digit of seven tells us that this individual is in health status group seven, which is they have three chronic diseases in multiple body systems. 060 is specific to the combination of the three diseases of CHF, diabetes, and COPD. And two indicates that the severity level for this individual is two. Another um, important feature of the CRGs is that while the CRG algorithm is complex, it is not necessarily a black box. Um, so Michael mentioned um, that the 3M logic is proprietary, but with a license, um, we have access to your online definitions manual, which provides the detailed information on the logic and the mappings of diagnoses to CRGs elements. So this is really important as um, a user of CRGs to be comfortable and understand and know that this information is available to be understanding which diagnoses will be driving some of the chronic conditions. Another important feature is the level of aggregation available, uh, which enable flexibility for reporting and analytics. So there are over 1,400 different CRGs, um, which can be rolled up at several levels of aggregation while still maintaining basic clinical meeting and severity leveling. So you'll see here as the groups become smaller with our example of 70602, 
um, the clinical precision is reduced a bit, but the number of groups becomes more manageable. Um, and you can see at the highest level of aggregation, um, our example is combined with other single chronic diseases to ACRG 372. In developing CRGs, uh, 3M sought to create four advantages over other metho methods of classifying individual health status. So first, as previously mentioned, CRGs are a patient-centric clinical model. Um, CRGs, again, we're focusing on the total burden of illness rather than one specific disease. Um, and again, CRGs are a categorical model that provide clinicians with actionable information, um, which contrasts with the statistical or regression-based risk score. The second advantage is that CRGs are suitable for all populations, including pediatrics and other non-Medicare cohorts. So many children's hospitals are using CRGs to define their patients for population health efforts. And CRGs are also capturing specific populations of interest, such as mental health and substance abuse, developmental disorders, HIV, foster care, and other social determin determinant of health factors. Uh, third, CRGs are a flexible tool that in include options to run um, either prospectively or retrospectively with or without pharmacy data um, and for multiple levels of aggregation. And then finally, CRGs provide essential risk adjustment for both capitated payment and value-based arrangements, as well as quality outcomes such as 3M potentially preventable events. So most notably, CRGs are used in value-based programs, um, mostly by payers, uh, to adjust payments to ACOs and also used by New York State to adjust capitated payments to Medicaid, Medicaid managed care organizations. So now let's move on to how CRGs are used for risk adjustment. CRGs, um, similar to HCCs, can be used to calculate relative weights um, and apply relative weights, which represent the average healthcare cost of people in a particular CRG relative to the cost of the average person overall in a given population. So 3M calculates relative weights based on a benchmark data set, um, and these are available to customers. Um, but alternatively, weight sets can be calculated using a population's actual data. Um, so a, a payer could create their own weight set or a state could create their own weight set. Um, and this can be more appropriate when measuring um, you know, a specific population. Weights can be set at the CRG or any of the aggregated levels. Uh, depending on the specific program policy, can have other factors like age, gender, um, line of business also built into the model. Um, but this is done after the fact. So the CRG um, is kind of independent of those other variables that could be added to the model. So let's take an example of two health plans that each serve three enrollees, shown on the right. On the surface, these plans may appear to be treating similar patient mix of individuals with diabetes. Um, but when we factor in CRG and risk adjust using relative weights, we can see that the population served by health plan B is actually much sicker than the population served by plan A. Um, so the case mix or, or the average illness burden um, is higher for health plan B than for plan A. So it's, it's accommodated by the CRG. So when we drill into what is driving this difference, uh, we can see that while all patients have diabetes, the patients in health plan B all have more significant illness or comorbidities or severity level than the three patients in health plan A. A, which is reflected in the higher weights. Um, so similar to what Michael was uh, talking through about adjusting the resources that are needed to treat these populations, um, this is what CRGs can bring to the table and allow for risk adjustment. So this is a sort of simple example of how they can be used, um, but just in sum, you know, a relative weight can be calculated for each CRG category, which can then be applied to the entire population at hand. So the same use of relative weights for risk adjustment can be applied for value-based purchasing programs. Um, and here's an example of one of those. So CRGs are used to support uh, value-based purchasing contracts in 11 states, um, which measure and pay provider entities such as ACOs or provider groups. 
in this case, you can see how an apples to apples comparison of provider performance can be creating using CRGs. So spending per member per month by providers two and four are almost identical when we do not factor in the disease burden or CRG weight of the attributed population. After applying CRG risk adjustment, you can see that provider two is actually treating a sicker population and therefore is expected to be spending more given the population's case mix. So here's just another example um, and to be aware that a lot of these arrangements um, are in place between either at the state level um, or at the health plan level with ACOs and provider groups. And then finally, um, in addition to CRGs being used for risk adjustment and for payment, they can also be used for a variety of other population health initiatives, such as uh, case management or, or care management. Um, this is an example of a chronic fallout report uh, where individuals are flagged who have lost their chronic CRG status. So in our example, this person who was highlighted has gone from having two chronic diseases to being a healthy non-user from one time period to the next. Um, and since we would not expect this person to you know, resolve a chronic issue, this can be an indication of either a potential gap in documentation or a gap in care that can be addressed. So thank you all for your time, and we hope that you now have a better understanding of 3MCRGs, um, how they compare and contrast with HCCs, and where they fit into your world as coding and CDI professionals, um, especially as we move towards risk-based payment. I'll now turn it back over to Jared to kick off the Q&A. Awesome. Yeah, let's move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you'd like to submit a question, you can use the questions feature in your web media controls located in the lower right corner of your screen. And as we submit your questions, uh, we wanted to let you know about a few upcoming events where you can connect with us in person. Next week, we'll be exhibiting at two events, a HEMA 19 Health Data and Information Conference, NAHQ Next, presented by the National Association of Healthcare Quality, and in October, we'll be at the Revenue Integrity Symposium presented by NAHRI. If you plan to attend any of these events, be sure to look us up. We'd love to meet you in person. Additionally, with the 2020 IPPS final rule going into effect on October 1st, we are offering an in-depth training to help you and your team prepare. 3M, 3M experts are providing their analysis and key takeaways in a series of seven on-demand educational videos. This is a paid educational series with great group discounting available. Go to 3m.com slash IPPS to learn more and register today. Lastly, we want to give you a chance to request more information on the issues covered today. So if you are interested in receiving more information about any of these topics, please select your top interest here. Okay, so for the first question, how do you recommend capturing ACCs in an inpatient CDI program? So that was a really good question. Um, you know, for um, on the inpatient side, really, um, you know, there's uh, you know a number of uh, pro um, you know professional encounters that are being coded on the inpatient side. So you know, for the professional service. Um, oftentimes that uh, can really capture a lot of the information um, and really is geared, you know, those professional services that are, you know, uh, you know a hospitalist sees a patient on the floor to kind of evaluate them and then, um, you know, is, is dropping a professional claim. A lot of the times uh, that, that's going to be where you're going to be capturing those HTCs, especially if the disease burden or status of a patient has changed as a result of an acute care um, uh, sort of um, uh, session of treatment or if somebody, you know, was inside of, uh, you know, an inpatient setting and, and there was a, you know, consultation that was 
called for professional evaluation of a new condition, um, these are really areas that, that we can capture those HCCs on the inpatient side. And Michael, this is Colleen, I can just add to that. So when you think about the hospital side, um, you know, the CETUS and the coder are looking at the DRG and they're looking at the APR DRG, but knowing the categories, and again, if you're a 360 user, this information is typically in that system, it's tagging HCCs, but think beyond. So in our current world, for most CDIs, we're looking at, you know, the DRG and we're looking at the APR DRG, but if you're seeing conditions that there are conditions that are HCCs that are not, just like we see things that are that affect the APR DRG but don't affect the DRG. Additionally, just having that third set of eyes on is there a condition here that maybe isn't affecting my hospital payment or affecting my SOI or ROM, but is an HCC that I should make sure gets clarified or captured. So I think there is an opportunity on the inpatient side for inpatient hospital CDI teams to help with HCCs for sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have today. So if we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure to follow up with you via email. Um, and just as a reminder that we will be sending out a link to the archive. So look for that in your inbox next week. Blaine, Michael, and Megan, thank you for this excellent presentation and thank all of you for joining us. This concludes today's 3M Health Information Systems webinar.